Say, Nikki, why don't we start this video by confusing everybody? Sounds good, Andy. All right. So this is Betsy Braddock. And this is also Betsy Braddock, now codenamed Psylocke. This is also Betsy Braddock, codenamed Psylocke, but now in a Japanese woman's body. Wait, what happened to Betsy's body? Funny you should ask. This is Betsy Braddock's body, now inhabited by Quanon. But don't worry, she dies pretty quick. Oh my. But now, this is Betsy Braddock in her original body. Is she still Psylocke? No, this is Psylocke, now Quanon, inhabited in the original Japanese assassin's body. So Betsy isn't Psylocke anymore? No, she's now Captain Britain. I think my head just exploded. Sounds about right. Why don't we unpack this mess? So by the very nature of how her character has worked and been in comics for so long, well over 40 years, we really can't start at the beginning with her if we're going to make this video make sense. She's been around since 1976, but that wasn't all consistently with her under the Psylocke name. So why don't we just focus on a little bit about where she first came from, but then fast forward to Psylocke. Does, okay. that, does yeah. that sound good? Sounds good to me. All right. So she was first introduced in Captain Britain number eight, which is when December 1976. She was created by Chris Claremont and Herb Tripp. Hopefully we're pronouncing that correctly. That we, me. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. And that was her initial beginnings. That was the blonde version of Betsy Braddock. Yeah, and I think it's worth mentioning her twin brother uh, would end up being Captain Britain. Yeah, Brian Braddock. Yeah. And she had an older brother named Jamie Braddock. All right, then let's fast forward to July 1986 with the New Mutants Annual number two. This was when we start to see the purpled hair, but British woman version now called Psylocke. She was called Psylocke by another creature named Mojo, which again is a whole video into itself. It's very confusing. So just know this interdimensional being kidnapped her and called her Psylocke. And that's where she originally got her name. That was his name for her. But for whatever reason, Professor X thought that was a great idea and gave it to her permanently later on. I mean, I would think she would have had PTSD about that name. I mean, but right. But okay. <laughs> So Professor X, you know, he's such a caring person. He's like, why don't you just remember that, that torturous moment of your life for the rest of your life with yeah, this code name? Because Betsy. when I, I read those comics with Mojo and all that, and they were, they were disturbing. Yeah, he's very sadistic. Yeah. And again, that's actually, I, I hope they do bring him into the game because I'd love to talk about him. But for this video, we can't go on that tangent. All so right. we're going to fast forward again this time to uncanny x-men issue number 255. in this issue there is only one page that has anything to do with betsy braddock and that's where we see that she has been taken captive by a crime lord known as matsuo suriaba hope i'm pronouncing that correctly and that's it you see her it's the last pane of that page she's sitting there she's not like bound up or anything but you know he has her, and that's it. You have to wait until the next issue, number 256, before we find out what her fate was. Yes, and this issue was crazy. <laughs> that's putting it lightly. <laughs> so Matsuo um, contacts the Mandarin, and he tells him about so having Psylocke. Um, the Mandarin is trying to build his name back up. He was just defeated by Iron Man. Yep. So they're going to use Psylocke as their new assassin, um, as kind of an Electra. Yes, I, I think it's a great way to say it. She's very Electra-like, except probably, well, I don't know, more deadly. That's debatable. So to do this, they have to get into her head, and they use somebody to do it. Um, I'm it's, not... it's using the ancient hands techniques, basically. Yes. So the, the ninjas you all know and love, they use those techniques to brainwash her. And it's really interesting, but also disturbing, this 
you get into, you see what's happening in her head and what she's doing is going through her whole life, starting as a child, all the way up until the present and killing everyone important in her life. So her brother, um, her friends, like the X-Men friends, like Colossus and Storm, um, and as she's killing them, she's taking a ring. Yeah. And which, so when she gets to the end and she gets all the rings, then I guess the transformation is complete. Yeah, but during this time, there is this figure whose face looks very similar to that of Mojo. And he says something to the effect of, you need a makeover. Yeah, and how he said it was just gross because he's like, it's time to go back to the body shop. And the reason that that's disturbing is that when Betsy lost her eyes to um, what, the what, slay master, the slay master, Mojo kidnapped Betsy and made her artificial eyes. And it was just a really disturbing episode. I'm sorry, issue. So that was that whole thing <laughs> was just really gross. Like, what what were some things you thought about it? As far as the, this one right the now. The transformation part. Yeah, it's, I, I really like how you put it. Because I, I, I knew this is what happened, but she is killing everyone important to her. And at the same time, you see that he puts this goop over her. And it's almost like it's peeling away a layer of her flesh. But instead of like tendon, skin, and bone, it's a whole new face underneath. Oh, and while he's doing it, he says, you can't be the leader, I think he says, of the hand um, looking like a Westerner. Right. I believe that's how he put it. I, yeah, I believe you're correct. And that's where we start to see the Psylocke that most people are familiar with. This is the Psylocke in the Japanese assassin's body. Now, not only did he, uh, not only did the hand brainwasher they switch the, the the consciousness the minds of betsy braddock into this new body and you didn't know this at the time but they moved uh the assassin's mind into betsy's own body because yes. she was comatose due to things that happened prior to this issue so to get back to the story she goes on she becomes the assassin she's very successful at it very successful enter wolverine Yes. And I think Jubilee, too. Jubilee, but more so Wolverine. More You're... so Wolverine. Jubilee was a part of it, but more so Wolverine. And this is why I've always loved the character of Wolverine. He is very much a big brother or just the person you want to help you when the worst possible thing happens in your life. Yeah. And it's not an easy rescue. In fact, she kicks his butt first. She ends up basically getting him captured and she stabs and she knows basically that uh her psychic abilities can easily overpower his psychic defenses and that's part of the problem he is just centimeters away in his mind's protectiveness from going completely feral like he did when the weapon x program was initially started in him he's about ready to go berserk He's also, you do wonder if he's kind of snapped. He's a little crazy. <laughs> yeah. he's, he's talking to Carol Danvers and Nick Fury. Like, they're there and they're not there. Yeah, the hallucinations. Yeah, so it, it's, it's funny. But in the end, they both rescue each other. It's not, you know, I, I originally thought he rescued her. No, they rescue each other. They help each other to get out. And now she has escaped She's duped the Mandarin, basically, and Matsuo. Uh, they made it look like she was still in full control and full under their control up until the end of the comic, where she eventually overpowers the Mandarin with Jubilee, to your point, and they all three escape. And at that point, Wolverine comments, you need to join the X-Men. Yeah, and she does. She does. And this is the beginning of a 20-plus year career as Psylocke, Betsy Braddock in the assassin's body. That is a great segue into now some of the defining features of who Psylocke is and what she does, starting with those psychic knives she has. So what's, a, what's the story behind those psychic knives, Nikki? So it's my understanding that when Betsy Braddock and Quanon 
uh, switched minds, Betsy gained some of Quanon's abilities. So the abilities of a ninja. So she's good with these knives and uh, she can plunge them right into someone's mind and do all kinds of nasty things, not to necessarily physically hurt them, although she can. Yeah, it, it was determined she could potentially kill. She put her brother into a coma. He, she basically wiped his mind, kind of like the Phoenix did to Mastermind using those blades in a one of the comics. Yeah, handy. Handy, literally. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see what you did there. We would see this in an interesting effect four years later in another world-shattering event in the comics in X-Men number 20. Now, in X-Men 20, Psylocke was definitely trying to start something with Scott, even though he was very much attached to Jean Grey at this time. Yeah, Scott's quite the ladies' man, isn't <laughs> he? He is, I guess. And in this particular issue... Psylocke had dressed up really in this... Scantily. Scant I mean, it wasn't too revealing, but yes, it was very tight black dress. It was in the middle of the day, and she was going to seduce him into lunch. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Lunchtime is a great time to do that. And you see him working on the, the Blackbird, the X-Jet, and she kind of comes in there, and he fumbles with it, and... Hydraulic fluid squirts everywhere. You know, there's no imagery with that. And during, he basically falls into her. She picks him up and she kisses him. And he's like, I can't do this. He runs away after explaining that he's very much with Jean. And Jean comes down and finds Psylocke. During this time, Jean, <laughs> she's not Phoenix right now, but she definitely is powerful. She just starts laying into Psylocke, and Psylocke is trying to walk away, not seeing anything. Eventually, she's had enough. She turns around before Jean realizes it and plunges that psychic blade into Jean's head, letting her know that nothing really has ever happened. However, because she thinks Jean is setting her up, at this moment, she sees another person in the room, which she believes is a hologram. This person is dressed just like her, except the her before she got into the assassin's body. So it's Betsy's body. It's Betsy's body, but she doesn't know this yet. It's just Betsy's costume right now, and she attacks her. And Psylocke attacks. No, 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 no. The, the, the hologram, the original-looking Betsy, attacks Psylocke. Okay. Yeah, again, this is where it gets confusing. So let's, let's make it very clear. The... OG costume that was Betsy Braddock attacks Betsy Braddock in the assassin's body. Yes. And it turns out it's not a hologram. It's the real thing. It's the real thing. So all the X-Men come down. Wolverine's about ready to stab th this person. And she takes off her mask. And it is Betsy Braddock. The original looking Betsy Braddock. But not really Betsy Braddock. Just Betsy Braddock's body. And this is Quanon. So from this point on, we're going to refer to her as Quanon. <laughs> Again, this is where it gets confusing. So Quanon is in Betsy Braddock's original body. This introduces us to Ravash, who will be around for a little while. She actually ends up joining the X-Men as well. We actually found out through our reading and our research that the writer kind of got confused at this point as to some of the past that had already been established and just kind of wanted to squash the whole thing. So he gave Ravanche the legacy virus. Yeah, he just killed her with he the virus. just yeah. killed her off. This had uh, a couple effects. Obviously, it removed Quan or, uh, Ravanche from the storyline. The Betsy Braddock body died. Now, one thing that was established when we first were introduced to Ravanche, she could create a psychic katana, which was technically more powerful than Psylocke's psychic knives. When Ravanche died, her powers got magnified, and Psylocke ended up absorbing those. That's how Psylocke was able to figure out how to create her own psychic katana ever after. So... I guess it pays 
to be next to somebody like you who dies? I don't know. What's the moral <laughs> of this story, Nikki? I, I'm not sure, Andy. I'm not sure. There was also some mysterious power swapping between her and Jean Grey. That would happen a little bit later on, but I think it's a good point. It's, it's kind of the same deal, though. It, it's all very mysterious how she and Jean Grey swapped powers. Right, and they never did explain it in the comics. This Chris Claremont came back to write some of the comics for a while. He was going to go back and create a little miniseries as to how this power swap happened. But basically, when he started writing, he time jumped six months. And after this time jump, Psylocke and Jean Grey switched power sets. Never explained how. And it would eventually work itself out where it was kind of considered Jean Grey got her telekinetic powers back. And that was maybe her secondary power set. Uh, because a lot of the mutants at that time were getting secondary powers. Or maybe it was the Phoenix returning. They left that ambiguous. And then much later on, after Psylocke died for one of the numerous times she dies, she got her own ability, her old abilities back as well. So, I mean. And weirdly enough, she lost interest in Scott. Right. She would go on to other people at this time, but never again did we visit the Scott and Psylocke Jean Grey love triangle. There you go. If you want to call it that. The next story that I think is relevant to Psylocke as she's related to the MCP game is Crimson Dawn. And that you can find in issue 328, Uncanny X-Men 328 through 330. And it starts out with Sabretooth is contained um, by Professor X. He's going to hand Sabretooth over to the U.S. government. Uh, they were trying to rehabilitate him, but they had decided he was just unsavable. Um, Professor X leaves the room. You see Psy Psylocke and Boomer looking on. Boomer is... She's a character from X-Force originally. Again, not, you don't really need to know much about her other than the fact that she can cause explosions with her uh, mutant ability. So she and Sabretooth have a history, and Sabretooth antagonizes her. Um, she gets angry and sets off an explosion. Of course, Sabretooth has his healing factor, so he is fine. Psylocke rushes in to contain Sabretooth or to save Boomer, maybe both, and Sabretooth basically rips her to shreds. She's, she's dying. Right. And that leads the adventure where Wolverine and Archangel go for this way to save her life while B stays back to try to keep her alive while they get this uh, thing to save her. And in the, the interim, they end up running into Doctor Strange because this is a mystic quest. They're, they're not using science this time. They're going to use magic to try to save her. So Wolverine knew about this uh, Crimson Dawn and he he finds somebody who helps them locate it um there is a guard they distract him um and i think that crimson the crimson dawn it looked like a heart yeah it looked like a heart with these black veins yeah the ebon veins around it so while she is dying while psylocke is dying they somehow bring her soul into this right so this is where dr strange basically she almost for the most part she dies she does flatline at this point but dr strange has created this vessel that has part of her soul in it and they throw it into the crimson dawn which is good enough instead of her having to drink from it her soul basically drinks from it so her life is saved and she has this mark above her eye it's the crimson dawn mark Right, so it does come at a cost, though. So it, it gives her some new abilities she never had. Uh, she can teleport through shadows now, and her psychic abilities, her sonics, are heavily boosted when she's under the influence of this Crimson Dawn. But it does come at the price of her soul. She becomes a lot more distant, cold, just not the kind of person you want to be around. 
And again, I think this is where you start to see the relationship between Archangel and Psylocke start to distance itself. They had been romantically linked for numerous times before this, and I think this changed her to the point where she no longer had those kind of feelings. All right, so that's the, the team tactic card, Crimson Dawn. I mean, that kind of makes sense. Right. In the, the game, it gives you a healing factor of one, which, first of all, you have to be injured to use it, which very close to the, the actual comic itself, she was eviscerated by Sabretooth. Uh, then gives her healing factor one, and she can move range one uh, at the beginning of her turn, which I'm assuming replicates the, uh, the shadow step ability that she gains, or the ability to move through shadows. Because like, you really can't do that any other way in the game right now. Very cool how they kind of took the game and the comic and married them together that yeah, way. Yeah, I love that. Before we start talking about the last storyline, we would be remiss not to explain why Psylocke is part of X-Force. And it has to do with the post-House of M timeline when Cyclops created X-Force or reconstituted X-Force to be a secret kill team that was taking out threats to the mutant population. Now, she was not part of that team, but after they did a number of very, very questionable things uh, with, under the leadership of Wolverine, who really did not want to be the leader of that team at the time, ultimately Cyclops disbanded it after it was discovered by the public and by the other X-Men that this kill team existed. However, Wolverine ultimately decided, no, this was a good thing, and he secretly, secretly reconstituted uh, X-Force, and this is the team that included Psylocke. He created the team with a specific goal of only having people who were true killers, who had killed in the past, and had a, a tendency to look the other way if it came down to saving or killing someone. So that's why she is a member of X-Force. It's an interesting storyline. It's a fairly long one. Uh, this is the Uncanny X-Force where they are, their first target was to kill a baby Apocalypse. Oh, wow. Right. So Apocalypse had been reborn, and they decided that they could not afford to allow him to grow into the killer that he would eventually be, that, well, assumed they would be. Uh, and it goes down to, is it nature versus uh, nurture of how you become evil? That's kind of the part of the storyline, but... Uh, that is very interesting. Yeah, so... I hope they didn't kill the baby. It's a good storyline. Uh, this, again, this is Uncanny X-Force. It would be too much of a rabbit hole for this particular conversation because it, it doesn't add anything more to Psylocke being in the game other than that's why she is part of X-Force in the affiliation rosters. Got it. But with that, why don't we talk about uh, the return of Betsy Braddock's body and how Betsy Braddock got her body back. Let's do it. <laughs> Let me set the stage for you, Nikki. In 2014, they decided that they needed to kill off another person fairly permanently in the X universe. And this time, Wolverine's number came up. The story of the death of Wolverine was a four-part series that ultimately led to him, quote, dying when he was covered in molten adamantium, uh, he did it by choice at that point, but his healing factor was gone and he most likely was going to die anyways. Years later, the, the, basically the statue that was created around him, the shell that was created, was cracked open and Wolverine's body was missing, which led to the hunt for Wolverine. And that's where we find ourselves now with Mystery in Madripoor, the hunt for Wolverine. And I love this story. I thought this was a lot of fun. I have to say it's my favorite that we read. Um, I really love the the story itself is just interesting. And then the fact that we've got five, no, six female characters coming together for a mission, a purpose. I just loved it. It really did seem like a Marvel Crisis Protocol game with or story with a game, you know, crossover because Viper was in this story. Yeah, and you don't see a lot of Viper, right? Not so, so much anymore. So we've got Psylocke, of course, Kitty Pride, Jubilee, Storm, Rogue, and Domino. It, and we find out a lot of interesting things about all those characters in this story. We do. So they come together 
because they want to find Wolverine. They want to know what happened to him, and if he's alive, find him. Right. And during that encounter, they end up meeting with the Femme Fatales, which is led by Viper. The person that we want to focus, though, on in this story was Sapphire Styx. And she's a kind of interesting character who's had a, a past with uh, Wolverine. Her main thing is she can absorb the life force of people. Doesn't matter who they are, mutants or non-mutants. She absorbs their life force. Yeah, she was crazy. She was so psychotic. She really was. And she was only supposed to take out Psylocke, not kill her. But she ends up killing her. She absorbs all of her life force, which absorbs her basic psychic essence, is kind of how they explain it. Is that how you interpret it? Yeah, their soul. Her, their, her soul. Yeah, yeah, there we go. And this led Betsy Braddock to find a fragment of Wolverine's soul also in Sapphire Sticks's mind. And what was kind of cool was they did this jailbreak. She rescued that soul fragment of Wolverine uh, and kind of did a jailbreak. And during this process, she reconstituted her whole body molecule by molecule to come back as the original Betsy Braddock. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because at the very end, she's talking to, I'm trying to remember, was it? Jubilee. Jubilee. And Jubilee's like, oh, so this is the real you. And, and when Jubilee first comes out, she says hello, but it's like H U L L O, right? Which means it's a Brit. It's a Brit. And I'm thinking back, like, did she? Did of course you're reading it, you're not hearing it. Did she have a British accent when she was in Quanon's body? Sometimes she did, but not a lot. So, because it's like they were very precise that they put that hello in there. That's originally how they made sure we knew she was a Brit, right? That's what I read somewhere. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was interesting. All right. And then the very last panel of, or and last page of this has a, a mysterious Psylocke looking woman attacking a bunch of people in Vietnam, which is the return of Quanon, who has been dead for quite a while. So Quanon somehow got her body back, but she was supposed to be dead, right? Right. And the so. body teleported. That's the other interesting thing. It <laughs> teleported to Vietnam. So, yeah. And it wouldn't be for a was few it months. Vietnam or it was Vietnam I thought Vietnam. Okay. If I remember correctly, okay. the very last thing. So she, and that's because I thought it was weird. Why is she in Vietnam? But I'm almost positive she was in Vietnam. Uh, we'll, we'll have to double check. We'll have check. to go back. And if not, we'll make a note. Right. But, yeah. <laughs> but it would be a few months later then, or maybe four months later, that she would actually return in the main comics Wolverine would be the one to encounter her, I believe. And that was the return of Quanon, now known as Psylocke. And that is where the, you know, when, when Betsy came back in her old body, she dropped the Psylocke name when Quanon came back because so many people thought of her, the, 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 the Asian assassin, as Quanon or as Psylocke. Right, right. But you know what? Betsy is the one that had Psylocke's name in the first place. I know. That's what really confused me when I started researching this. So it's all pretty funny. Although, as we mentioned, we didn't think Betsy would want the name Psylocke in the first place because it's kind of, that's what Mojo named Yeah, her. that was her. So. <laughs> and maybe that's it. Maybe she was finally coming to peace with the fact that this was not part of her anymore and the other, Quana did not have that kind of emotional baggage when it came to that name. Yes. So I, this was probably my favorite story that we read. I liked it. I liked the way um, all of the, the friends got together looking for Wolverine. Yeah. I liked the mission. Um, oh, Magneto was in it. Magneto. <laughs> Weirdly, like, Magneto was kind of hot. <laughs> right. I was like, that's Magneto? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it was. It was kind of a, a a buddy caper, if you will. It really was. And it was a super fun story. And it reminded me of the old school stories uh, in a lot of ways. Because a lot of the new stuff, especially the most recent stuff, is not fun for me anymore when it comes to the X-Men. This harkens back to when I really enjoyed those kind of stories. Yeah. It, I, I don't know if I liked it quite as much as the Beta Ray Bill. No, no, buddy, no. Buddy, him and... No, 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 no. That... 
that is itself is a special uniqueness that <laughs> yes, that's got to be like... But it does harken to that. It does. It's like these uh, women, these mutants yeah. getting together and working together for a single purpose. I really like that. And they were friends. And they were friends. Most of the time. Right. Domino was the outsider, which was kind of hilarious. But... but in the end, because Domino and Jubilee, and who was... There was one more of them. Kitty Pride. Kitty Pride were kind of the ones that got away right initially they, they said they took out the heavy the femme fatale took out the heavy hitters which was psylocke rogue and storm but the soft ones evidently so that was also cool because they had to get together and try to figure out how to rescue the heavy hitters right and they were like how are we going to do this they got captured how are we going to rescue them so it was just a really neat story right and again to kind of put a boat on to the the final part of this story then too or afterwards cap or uh betsy braddock would go on to take on the title of captain britain she would actually lose the psi knife she never uses it again but she does summon a psi sword uh psychically created psi sword this one is no longer katana it is more of a european medieval looking sword uh and so she's kind of fully kind of moved away from the the persona she had for the last 20 some years so that point. belongs to quanon now that is 100 percent quanon betsy's got her british back <laughs> she, betsy's i got guess her, british her back. <laughs> yeah i don't know i don't know how to say all that but <laughs> quanon is now the um assassin from japan as she should be right betsy is her old self she's the knight she's captain britain again so yeah. really interesting stuff um Anything else before we kind of go into the tactics of how we would bring Psylocke onto the table? You know, I, what do you think of this character? Do you, I liked her in this story, but there were other stories I read that I felt like I didn't get to know her as well, or she was just being manipulated by someone. Yeah. And that's the problem I think with a lot of these stories is they if there was such a thing, she's typecast into the storylines for a lot of things in Marvel Comics. I like Psylocke's character. I enjoy her, uh, mainly because that's part of the when I started reading the comics was back in the 90s when she was very prevalent in there. Uh, this is the, the X-Men of 92 type uh, timeline. And I just, you know, yes, she was kind of uh, manipulative at the time. But or, she was, or she was being manipulated. Or being manipulated. But she was kind of like a, and forgive the term, a Wolverine-esque character. She was the, you know, the killer, the female killer for the team that did things that no one else wanted to do because she felt she had to. And she could do them. And she was a problem solver for them. But everyone just kind of, except for Wolverine, kind of looked down upon her. Um so she was an outsider at the same time. You know, I don't think she ever fully, well, for a lot of the stories, she was fully embraced by the team, you know, for I what she brought. I was kind of interested in her romance, I guess, with Archangel. Yeah. I, but I, I didn't get to read a whole lot of that. Um, but I like this kind of, this, that's one of the reasons I like this story is she was working together with her friends for a purpose right and i felt like some of the older stories it wasn't so much no so, no yeah especially like in the, the the early 90s when she was fighting with gene over scott yeah, and all that I mean, come on you know like i don't like those stories so they're just <laughs> silly um but, but yeah i think there's so much out there though that i haven't read yet let me put that out there so if you're listening and you have a story or a that you want to recommend about Psylocke I agree, or yeah. something that you love about Psylocke that we didn't talk about absolutely I'm willing to read anything about her now right yeah the one thing I want to go back and read is when the apocalypse protocol happened I, I can't remember what the exact term was apocalypse was dead archangel became the new apocalypse and he took Psylocke as one of his horsemen and that was supposed to be, I think she became the dark Mandarin or Lady Mandarin again at that point. I, I can't remember uh, how they termed it, but it seems like a fairly interesting storyline. But that was ultimately, I believe, the end for her and Archangel when that whole thing resolved. But it sounds interesting as to him becoming the new 
apocalypse and creating his own horsemen. So yeah, that sounds good. That's one. And I, I do want to go back and read the uncanny X-Force again. I started it a long time ago. I don't remember why I stopped, but uh, yeah, good stuff. But I think the, the ones we talked about today had a lot to do with her uh, character in the game. Right. And do we want to talk about that next? Yeah, let's talk about that. All right, looking at her card, she seems like a fairly awesome character to bring to the board, even yeah. if you're not playing X-Force or Uncanny X-Men. She's pretty good, yeah. Three, three, four. So three physical, three energy, four mystic. She's going to be able to take on quite a bit. But what makes that even better is she's a martial artist. She's a martial artist on top of being stealth. On top of being stealth. So, I mean, that really does go into playing with her being a ninja. I mean, that's what they do. She's got enhanced martial arts skills. She hides in the shadows. Yeah, I think they did a really great job of showing how uh, her fighting style from the comics plays into Marvel Crisis Protocol itself. Yeah, and the fact that she's, you know, she's got three defense on physical, three on energy. She can also um, spend power to modify any number of attack and defense dice. So using that telepathic precognition. You have to use the power, but it's there. Well, that's just for the attack. It's not for, I'm sorry, you're right. Yeah, it is attacking and defending. And defending, I apologize. So... Which is interesting because that's not how she works necessarily in the comics. I mean, she does have it, but it's dream-based precognition. So she'll have dreams that things are going to happen, but not like in the heat of the moment. So mm -hmm. it, again, it works out. I mean, it, it, it's still, it's an interesting you know, way of doing it. There's so many changes they did to her character over the years. There could have been a, a an issue out there somewhere where she did have it. I don't know. Right. Um. Also, what I found interesting was her telekinetic katana. Yeah. Um, she can choose whether it's energy or mystic. And I think that is the first time I think we've seen that in the game. That's what I was just trying to think. Is there anyone else that does that? I don't think so. I think it's usually physical or energy. Or you have to pay to do it, like with Doctor Strange's leadership. Right, yes. But not somebody who can just choose between it. And then the neural disruption, that's pretty awesome. I mean, yeah. that's what happens. That's what she does so many times in the comics. Uh, she hits somebody and it fries their head. So, And I like her Cybo because she's going to gain a power, you know, whether she gets damage or not. She gains a power. Yeah, so and, she's got two zero cost attacks. Right. And that came from X-Men Volume 4, actually, where she learned to use the uh, Jean Grey's abilities, tele uh, telekinetics. Yes. And, and we do have a couple instances of her creating a Cybo and attacking people with it and it's got that nice pursue ability so she's got some movement mechanics she does so her big attack is her psionic assault it's seven dice um pretty good you're gonna stun them one way or another yep i think if it was any better she couldn't be a four cost anymore okay and i think one of my favorite things that her superpowers is the telekinetic combat enhancement so she pays two power, she mo she can move short, and then she adds two dice to her attack roll. Uh, I think it's the telekinetic yeah, katana. It, yeah, it doesn't. She adds two dice. I love that. I love that. Yeah, and I've got a picture on screen right now of her nailing Sabretooth with this attack. It, she's not using her katana, she's just punching him. But it's, see, you can see the psionic force surrounding her as she takes him out with one hit <laughs> and, and this is post crimson dawn so she wants a little bit of payback on that one <laughs> yeah so great character and i think she'd work well with a lot of affiliations right and then so we've talked about the crimson dawn team tactic we did the tel telekinetic construct is the other one she has psionic construct i'm sorry sonic construct and that's a, an interesting one it basically allows her to turn an attack an allied attack into a mystic attack yes and then she can reroll or that person can reroll any number of the dice which i think is the extra awesome part that well, they can reroll any number of the dice maybe because like they're they're it's that precognition maybe working into it where yep. they know what was supposed to happen uh but knowing me i'd roll 10 blanks and then reroll re 10 blanks and skulls <laughs> this time so yeah that's true <laughs> but, but overall yeah this she is so thematically built and again Big, big props to Atomic Mass Games on really mindfully putting 
you know, her together based off of multiple eras of her in the comics. But nonetheless, she is represented very well from the comics in this one. She is. I love this character, so can't wait to play her. How would you play her? I mean, let's not worry about affiliation necessarily. How would you play her? Well, um, I haven't had a chance to play her yet, but just kind of thinking about it, I feel like you can kind of have her back in the shadows a little bit, but also she, you can move her very quickly. Um, she's got her uh, telekinetic precognition. I'm sorry, not that one. The, uh, the Cybo? telekinetic combat enhancement where she can pay power to move short um, and then add to, to her attack. So she's got good defense mechanisms and good attack. Um, and then also she's got pursuit on her cybo, which is zero cost attack. So if, you know, after, well, you have to roll a hit, which is, you know, pretty easy to do. So roll a hit and she can pursuit. So I think she can kind of play a lot of roles, really. Yeah. You know, the, her only downfall, really, when it comes down to it, is she's got no physical attacks. Yes, that is true. And there are certain people who, you know... That's really the only way you can take but them But she can choose between energy or mystic. Or mystic. So that kind of gives her an edge. Yeah. And you just, I think, want to place her appropriately with somebody else who maybe can do more damaging physical attacks if that's what the scenario calls for. But I think martial arts really, between the fact that she's got four mystic and then three uh, physical and mis or, uh, energy with martial arts, she's going to be able to take on a lot of attacks. And if you play your, your cards and your, your power, right? If she does end up getting hurt, hopefully you'll have enough power to go ahead and bring in Crimson Dawn, assuming you brought that ability, and now she's got a healing factor in the game. She does, and she's got her um, Saibo, which she can gain power that way. And you can keep, that's so, a, range four is great. I mean, it's only four dice, but. That is great, so yeah, absolutely. She is very, very versatile. She can she do is, whatever you need her to do. she can be a support player with her um, psionic constructs. Yeah. So I think overall, any way you kind of want to play her, you can. I mean, if you want to waste the points and keep her in the back to score points. Oh, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't either, but you could if you needed but to. But she can kind of like, like I said, kind of jump out of the shadows. So. And I tell you what, you can't downplay the fact that in a late game, when you maybe just need to secure a couple points, having stealth and being able to pull her back to maybe contest or secure uh, and your enemy can't attack, you know, if they're not within range three or closer, that's powerful. So, mm -hmm. and the fact that she can do that, she can be up in the front, but if you need her to run to the back and take something to score the game, that's well, awesome. And the fact that she's got martial artist on top of her telepathic precognition, all that, it's, and the Crimson Dawn on top of it. I mean, she's got a lot of defense. So A lot of defense. You just have to be careful on how you're going to spend that power at that point. Yeah. She can be a trap if you're not careful, which that those are some of the best characters to play. Mm -hmm. So overall, <laughs> very, very excited to see her on the table. Uh, any final thoughts on anything Psylocke? No, just Psylocke's a pretty interesting character. She's uh, morphed a lot over the years. By far. But she, they're kind of doing like a rich OG Betsy now they're kind of back to the original Betsy so um but this particular Psylocke in this game very interesting and lots of material out there to read like I said we just we barely even scratch the surface of it yeah, so a ton of material out there all right well as always we appreciate everyone listening uh you will be seeing Psylocke in our next game and until then we appreciate you, you joining us bye bye